Hello everyone and welcome to episode 7 of the Midweek Mart. Here is your host Robbie from Robbie's Talking Tees. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is episode 7 of the Midweek Mole. We've been away for a little while over Christmas and New Year. I was, I did take some time off, but I ended up catching COVID. So once I got out of isolation, it took me a couple of weeks to get myself together and get back into recording. So I apologize to everyone who's been anxiously waiting for this new episode. Here it is, we're back. We're gonna be posting regularly now every week, Tuesdays or Wednesdays, depending on when I get it filmed and can get it out to you. So today's topic, it's a good one. While I was in isolation, or just after I got out of isolation, I was sat thinking to myself, what topic could I possibly cover in the first episode back? So what I did was I went over to the community tab on my YouTube channel and just wrote a little question asking, are there any topics or any questions that you guys want answered? And I come across an absolutely fantastic one, which is what I'm covering today. And it's from Caitlin Whiteman or Whitman Whiteman. I hope I said that right. I apologize if I didn't, but the question was, how about overweight tarantulas? I'm always concerned I'm overfeeding my spiders. I want my slings to grow, but I don't want to cause any harm. Now that is a great question, as there are a lot of people in the hobby that strongly believe that you can overfeed tarantulas, you can make them overweight, and it, I, I, I can understand that. The reason why they think that is when a tarantula eats, it stores all the food in its abdomen. The abdomen gets bigger, swells up. There's a theory out there that if the tarantula has a fall or it gets caught on something, it's easier for it to tear, there's easier for it to burst if it's dropping from a height, which is absolutely reasonable. Now, I sat and thought about it for a little while and I thought to myself, well, there's a lot of counter arguments to that. As much as it makes sense, as much as I understand a tarantula with a big booty, there is a risk of that happening. I've personally never have had it happen in my collection. I've never experienced it. But I thought to myself, you know what? The only way the tarantula is going to have a fall or get snagged on something or have an accident that's going to make it burst and the tarantula eventually end up dying is if the enclosure that it's in isn't suitable. Now what I mean by that is, say you've got yourself a fossorial tarantula. You've, given, you've, you've got it in a, a 30 by 30, 30 enclosure, no doors on the front, full up with substrate that it can burrow down in. If that tarantula has eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten and his booty's swelled up, it's down in a burrow. It's gonna sit still, it's gonna eat as much as it needs to to get to pre-molt, then it's gonna go down in that little burrow, it's gonna web it up, there's no risk of injury. It's just going to sit there until it's time for molt. Terrestrials is the same. We always say when setting up a terrestrial enclosure, you have to give it enough substrate in there so that it can burrow and also to limit the height from the top of the enclosure to the level of the substrate. Just purely so that even if it wasn't overweight, there's no risk of it climbing up falling off and rupturing its abdomen. Our ball reels, they're better at climbing. I've never seen an arboreal fall, even though I have heard reports on groups of their arboreal was molting, it flipped over, it fell out of its molting web and has hit the floor in the enclosure. But those reports are very, very few and far between. 
And it also it got me thinking that in a tarantula's life cycle, a tarantula is only ever going to eat as much as it needs to get to the pre-molt stage. So it doesn't matter if it takes if it eats it in a week, it eats it in six months, or it eats it in a year, it's still gonna consume the same amount of food. What do tarantulas do when they get to pre-molt? They start refusing food. So the whole idea to me personally of overfeeding a, a tarantula, I don't think it exists. The tarantula knows how much it needs. It knows how much it needs to consume before it goes into the pre-molt cycle. It, you know, you give it water, it fills up on water. The tarantula's not stupid. Tarantulas aren't gluttonous animals like we are, where we eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and pile on the pounds and get overweight and, you know, for no other reason than greed. Spiders eat when they're hungry. So if you're giving it food and it's eating it, it needs it. So as far as having over, overweight animals, I don't believe that's an issue. The only time that you would ever have to do that is if you look at your enclosure and you know it has got a height that it can fall from or it is like a burrowing species that can't burrow and you know client climbs the enclosure and makes some sort of weird web construction you know that's what it all boils down to the husbandry we have of the species in question now I've never had one rupture. I've never had an animal with any problems. I know there are a few species that, you know, eat right up until up until they molt even. I've heard reports of some tarantulas that, you know, eat on a Monday night and by the Tuesday morning, they're on their back, they're molting. Some species do that. But still, it doesn't mean that they're going to be they're they're over consuming food or, you know, that they're not getting enough to eat. I just don't believe that exists. I think that it's possible that the that it did happen a lot in the past when husbandry information and how tarantulas were kept was a whole new thing and there wasn't much information on how to keep them correctly i believe that, that you know the majority of keepers back then would have had the wrong setup they would have used like stones or pebbles or you know wood chip a substrate which they can get snagged on and you know these issues may have happened back then but now we've learned and we've evolved our husbandry methods, I don't think it's ever going to be a problem. And like I said, it, people are worried that it may get caught on something. The only way it's gonna get caught on something is if you put something in the enclosure that it can get caught on. Like I, I've seen people put toys in enclosures, they've put objects in there that may have sharp edges, that you know, that can cause injury, but an overweight tarantula is gonna cut itself on that whether it's overweight or not. And you asked us the question about slings. Now, if you're keeping a sling in a tiny little sling pot or a vial that's filled with substrate, moist substrate that it can burrow in, there's no risk of a fall. And it's not gonna overeat itself to death. It's not gonna keep consuming food until there's no space and it's gonna magically pop. That's just not gonna happen. It's going to eat as much as it needs and then just stop eating. It will refuse food. It will say no more. I've had enough. It will go down into its burrow. It will go into pre-molt and it will eventually molt. So that that is my take on the whole question. I don't think you can overfeed tarantulas and I don't understand people that, you know, you go into a group or an an Instagram post or something like that and you'll see a tarantula photo and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's healthy, it's thriving, it's well looked over, looked after, but it has a big booty. 
And you look in the questions and you see people going, that tarantula's too fat, you've overfed it, that's dangerous for the ta tarantula. I don't think it is. I think what's more harmful is the abuse that people are so readily able to give to people that's more harmful in the hobby that's more harmful to the tarantula because that's going to get the person that's looking after it second guessing and then they're more likely to make husbandry mistakes that put it at harm because they're, they're second guessing they're going to go oh, well i'll change this or do that you know what well, the, the worst part what well, uh, like that i can see is they stop feeding as much the tarantula goes hungry and eventually starves to death like you know, that's the sort of things that happen when you put insecurities into people's heads. Like, you make them second guess themselves and then they start doing the wrong thing when they was actually doing right all along. So that's something I think that needs to be worked on in the hobby. The, the up, update of information and care information, a constant update, which, you know, there's YouTubers out there and there's websites and things like that that are giving absolutely fantastic up-to-date information and if information changes they're quick to update it they're quick to pull it out there so everyone knows the score and knows should know how to keep their animals now i know there's people out there that don't bother researching they don't bother going on youtube they don't bother looking up and they just buy the animal and then they're like oh what do i do now but you know that's always going to happen no matter what the best we can do is thrive to be better at getting information out there and thrive to be better on how we deliver that information so to answer your question caitlin no, I don't think you can overfeed your tarantulas. As long as they're happy, they're healthy, and, you know, they're just doing their thing, just continue what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Don't worry about it. So next up, I had a question from the Spider King, which says, when did you get your first tarantula and what made you decide to get into the hobby in the first place? Well, my first tarantula that I got was a Brachypelma homori. Now, I'd always wanted one since I was a little child, ever since I watched Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, or was it the first one? Well, the Indiana Jones film where they show, they go into the cave and they've got the torches and he turns around and he's got all the Brachypelma homori climbing up his back. I was blown away at that film. I was like, oh my God, how beautiful is that? I want to have one. But you know, back then it wasn't that easy to come by. And also I had two parents that as soon as I said I want one, they said, no, you're not having one. Which was really weird in my household because growing up, I was allowed snakes, I was allowed lizards, I was allowed dogs, we had hamsters, we had fish, I even had barn owls for a long time, I bred barn owls and sold them for many many years and was really in, into falconry and stuff like that, but when it came to tarantulas my parents was like no, that's the one animal you're not getting, not in this house, never. So then fast forward a few years, um, I moved out and I was flicking through YouTube one day and just watching videos in general and I came across Tom's Big Spiders, I also came across Dark Den and I started watching their content because that fascination I had all those years ago as a child was still there. And after watching their channels and soaking up all that content, I was like, you know what? I can do this. I can do it. Like, I've got no one to tell me no. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to get one. And that's what I did. I went online. I searched for how do I purchase a tarantula. The spider shop popped up. 
I went on the Spider Shop website, I saw that they had juvenile Brachypelma homoris, and I was like, right, that's the one I'm going to get. But I don't know anything about it. I need to I need to look this up first before I click buy. So that's what I did. I went away. I did my research. I researched everything I could possibly find on Brachypelma homori, and then that was it. I went and bought one. Cut the next day in the post, bosh, there it was on my doorstep. I already had the setup because I still had the enclosures I had from keeping reptiles and stuff in the past. I, you know, the, that day that I ordered it, I, I ordered the cocoa fiber that went with it, the water dish, so everything come in the post for it. I set it up and that was it. From then on, I was absolutely hooked on tarantulas. And the, the best thing about it was for days, for days and weeks and months, and even to this day, when I look at them enclosures, I am captivated by them. I can't stop looking at them. I can't stop watching them. I can't stop noting their behavior, examining what they're doing and trying to learn. Even like, you know, when I'm not in the tea room, I'm reading scientific papers, I'm watching documentaries, reading books, anything I can get my hands on to soak up everything that, you know, all the information and content I can get. And yeah, that is how and, you know, why I got into the hobby. And then since then, it's grown. I don't think there's been a week that goes by that I don't get a delivery. I don't get a new species in the collection. I don't have something coming in. I am absolutely hooked. The addiction in the hobby is absolutely a real thing. And for me, I don't think that addiction is ever going to disappear. And then on the back of that, because I was so inspired by Tom's Big Spiders, he was a huge influence on me and the Dark Den. Who else was there? There was, who else did I watch back in the day? There was Spoods and stuff. He was doing his channel. I really enjoyed his content. There was Tarantula Cat. I watched her a lot. It's just endless, endless, endless endless amounts of YouTubers that I started soaking up. And you know what? It really, really shocked me when I decided to start putting out content because I was influenced by those people and wanted to, to make my own content and release my own information from what I was personally finding as I was soaking it in, that these people that I looked up to for so long became friends with them. We, we have good chats, we've done collaborations in the past, got collaborations going on in future, and you know, that, that friendliness in the hobby, I think, is, is a huge part of what made me keep going with it as well. I think if I was one of the poor people that I mentioned earlier that got shot down, got told I was bad, got, you know, ridiculed and basically harassed and bullied. I think that I would probably would have just taken my one Hamori, been happy with that and just disappeared into obscurity. I would have never checked out Instagram posts or, any, or made any of the friends that I have today in the hobby. So I'm really thankful that that happened and that's been my journey and one i'm going to continue doing for years and years and years to come but like i don't see myself going anywhere any time soon because i enjoy doing this too much i enjoy the subscribers i enjoy the good feedback i even enjoy the negative feedback because with negative feedback now that just gives me something to think about and something to learn from it's constructive criticism to me there's nothing you can say to me that will make me go, you know what, I've had enough, I'm giving up, no more, I can't take this any longer. So anyway, Spider King, that's your question answered. So I'm going to do one more that we got. 
from Tarantula Chris. Tarantula Chris wrote, what's your favorite old world or new world and why? Oh, what's my favorite old world or new world? Hmm. Well, actually he added to that. And why? Laugh out loud. Mine's old world because I love the spice. I'm guessing he means like the the defensiveness and the boldness and the you know everything that comes with old worlds. Now I honestly cannot answer this question just picking one. The problem I've got is my absolute favourite two genuses above any other on the planet. One is Peace Lotheria and one is Formictopus. Now Peace Lotheria, they're old worlds and Formictopus, they're new worlds and I can't pick one or the other. So all I can do is tell you my two favourite genus and you know, I'll toy with that idea forevermore. If you want to know what my favourite species are, Peace Lotheria would be Peace Lotheria Metallica or Subfusca Lowland. They're joint top as the two, for me, the two most stunning in the genus. And that's why I've got a fair few of them at the moment. I think I've got three of each. Yeah, and I'm always looking for more. As for Formictopus, my favourite species of Formictopus would either be uh, Dominican Purple or, or Formictopus Full Green. Either one of those. Again, I can't choose between the two the the dominican purple those adult colors those blue legs the purple tones everything that goes with it that is an absolutely stunning species you don't see that coloration too often in the hobby you see little flashes of it here and there but you don't see anything where it's just one solid oh my gosh that is such a gorgeous species but then on the other hand You've got the species full green, and there's just not enough green tarantulas in the hobby. So for me, it's like, wow, green. And it's like a, a jade emerald green sort of color. But it, it just pops whenever you film it or take photos of it. It's just gorgeous. Absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. So that, that's your question answered Chris I hope I hope and you know for Mictopus like you said that you like old worlds because of the spice for Mictopus can be just as spicy I've got an adult female Cancerides which puts any of my old worlds to shame he, like you my OBT placid as anything any of my OBTs I've got several color forms they are little kittens in comparison to that female Cancerides. So again, you know, you like the spice of old worlds, but new worlds can be just as spicy. If you think about it, Ferrophosa, they're not, they're not old worlds. Look how spicy they can be. Not that they are, you know, they can be quite laid back. I mean, I've got the Ferrophosa Apophysis, which I'm rehousing in Saturday's video in my first ever bioactive enclosure. And you know, 99% of the time, that girl is calm. She doesn't really move. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't bat an eyelid when you open the enclosure and do your stuff. But when she's in pre-molt, that is when she gets feisty. That is when the you know the defensive mode turns on and you get the threat postures and you get the slapping and you get all that sort so for me from a, a from knowing the spider when i see that i go ah you're in pre mold don't feed you just make sure you you know you've got your moisture you've got your water dish you're all good and just leave you alone and and regular enough every time she's like that she molts not long later right now 
She's about uh, six to s six inches in diagonal leg span after her last molt, five to six inches, which is why I'm doing the upgrade on Saturday. I don't know if you watched last week's video when I went and into Epping Forest and got all the decorations and stuff for the bioactive enclosure. I have set it all up. I have given it the week so that all the springtails and the isopods can, you know, start doing their thing. The plants in there can get climatized to the environment and start to grow. And so, so everything can start turning and living and, you know, becoming a true bioactive enclosure. I've just left it there for the week, watered the plants, etc. So I'm going to rehouse her on Saturday. I can't wait. My first ever bioactive. Can you believe it? All this time in the hobby and I've never actually done one. So I'm excited. I think it looks great. I've shown it to a few people and they think it looks awesome. So I'm really excited to get her in there. So hopefully on Saturday you tune in for that video. You don't want to miss it. So that's it. Those are the three questions that I'm answering in this podcast. I think I've waffled on long enough so i'm going to end it here hopefully you enjoyed it hopefully you found it informational hopefully you took something from it really hope that more of you go down into the comments and post more questions because without your questions this podcast can't happen so get down there write them in there now i would rather sit here and answer your questions and your queries and interest you with things you want to know rather than sit here scratching my brains thinking are they going to listen to that are they not do they want to know that do they not it just makes it so much easier so for those questions last week in the comments thank you i appreciate it this podcast wouldn't be here without you but that's it no more i'm not waffling anymore we're going to end it here so i'll see you in saturday's video and I'll also see you in the next episode of the Midweek Mole. Take care. <laughs>